This is the philosophical angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available online free for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the school, uh, the Stern School of Business, New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, England, established 1809. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Chris. Rick Samuelson graduated from Yale, is also with us. He has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts. He is also retired head of securities, UBS Japan. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format of the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept for your consideration and our panel will, re will react with criticisms, questions, and their own definitions. This week, the subject concept of usage is immigration, particularly immigration when it's concerned with the rights of the individual in immigration. So to introduce, I will summarize the nature of a right. When speaking of immigration, the term rights is often invoked, such as the right of citizenship to those born here within the U.S. Before we get into the subject of immigration or any other subject whereby we speak of rights, let us, def let us define this term right. <clears throat> the philosophical angle declares that all rights come from God, passed to man who then receives some of them who then gives some of them to government, keeping the remaining rights in the possession of the individual man. We may cite the Declaration of Independence, and thus Jefferson, Locke, or we may cite Thomas Paine for his tract, The Rights of Man. But at this point, it should be understood to make this explanation precise that all rights exist and are created First, inside an agreement, contract, covenant, or other such mutual understanding. Thus, when a right passes from God to man, it passes by virtue of its being noted inside an agreement. And so there is firstly established between the Lord, our God, and his people a covenant. For example, the Old Testament which is then modified in the New Testament. Man thusly endowed with his natural rights passes some of them along to the government when we establish the Constitution, which is an agreement between the people and its government delineating the rights of each. The reason that all rights exist within contracts and agreements is that people realize that in order to be more effectively, to more effectively produce goods and services, people are more efficient cooperating than they are as individuals acting alone. Hence, in order to cooperate, we make agreements which delineate obligations for the different parties. And we fulfill these obligations for which we receive the right to a consideration. Thus, it may, may be laid out as an equation. Taking note of our board, person A has an obligation to perform something for which he will receive a consideration from person B, who has the right to receive the performance of something for which he pays the consideration. And the same goes in the opposite fashion for B, resulting in A's rights and obligations, equaling B's rights and obligation. 
that is, each has an obligation to perform for which he would receive a right to a consideration. By the way, to summarize, the explanation in order to make this a little clearer, we produced to bring ourselves up away from misery, which is the essence of that which is good. And in order to produce and attain more that is good, we cooperate for the sake of efficiency. In order to cooperate, we make agreements in which each part has an obligation to provide something and the right to receive something. This something is called the consideration. The fulfillment of rights and obligations of agreements is called justice. Further, just to tie everything together, the more or greater is the consideration, the more we respect it. And the, and the appropriate dispensation of respect is known as that which is ethical. Our overall summary, <clears throat> hence, when one person respects someone, that person is being ethical toward that other person. And we respect something in order to cooperate with someone, as respect is the evolutionary means that allows cooperation, in which there are agreements, in which there lie rights and obligations, which we use to produce things which brings us up away from misery, which is that which is the nature of good. With that said, let us turn to the question of immigration and the rights involved thereof. Mark, I'd like to start with you. I wonder if you have some opening comments on immigration. I have lots of comments on immigration, but uh, this seems to be a, a continuing theme throughout all our lectures. The introduction has nothing to do with the topic. So you were talking about obligation of person B who has done something for person A and uh, all that. But I, I don't see, wh what is the link to immigration? What link are you trying to make? That um, when a person arrives in the United States or and, and then children are born in the United States, uh, they have a right to citizenship. As well, they, they, have, they have a right because that's what the, the U.S. Constitution says. Correct. And if you don't like if you don't like that or you want to argue with that, all you have to do is amend the Constitution. It was passed for a decent reason in the 19th century. If we don't like it today, or we, don't, we think that you know pragmatically it no longer works. We should probably amend the Constitution. But That's you first correct. start off by saying that first you first start off by saying that all rights come from God, uh, which I agree with. But then you suddenly went into citing people like Tom Paine, who was at best a deist probably more likely an agnostic, and certainly by no stretch of the imagination was he a Trinitarian Christian. So you went from it coming from God to citing somebody who was kind of anti, certainly anti-Christian and more likely anti-religion uh, uh, and, you know, one of these brilliant Enlightenment thinkers who, who was speaking in the vein of the French Revolution, which could have done, a few things have done more harm to religion, tradition, and, and, and the belief that rights come from God. Uh, than Tom Paine. But I, I think the, the question that you got to look at is uh, what right do people have to immigrate? And it's pretty much very little, if any, right at all. There is almost no right. We have the right to decide. Citizens of a country have the right to decide who they will and will not admit. And I think that's a more interesting issue to discuss. Okay, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, that is an interesting uh, uh, question to, uh, to uh, observe. And uh, who we should admit and who we should not. Um, but that, you know, that, that, that point, that's not, that's not part of the discussion that's going on in the United States today. It is, you know, you're a mean person if you say that we should be at all selective or limit the number of people who can come and, and, and things like that. So what used to be, you know, a, a big procession of people coming from Western Europe has now turned into something completely different and completely unlike all previous waves of immigration. Well, that's an interesting question. Should we be selective or not? Oh, absolutely. Okay, and, and, and when we are selective, what criteria do we use? Well, you know, an, an, a nation is, is at its base uh, uh, united through language, history, and culture. So you can start off with language. We might want to let people in who speak English, people who come from places where they speak English, 
people who share our history. So you kind of look again at Western Europe, people who believe in you know the uh, uh, Anglo version of the law, or maybe even the Napoleonic version of the law, uh, and then culture. You know, we don't do uh, cousin marriages like some countries in the Middle East do. We don't, we don't amputate the hands of thieves. Uh, we don't do polygamous marriage. You know, we, we, there are a lot of, we, although we're probably about to. Uh, there are a lot of things that we don't do culturally that we don't really, not in our interest to bring in people who are going to bring ideas that are radically different from our culture and start to balkanize our country. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, Rick, do you agree uh, that we should be selective in our immigration policies? Yes, I, I think um, our immigration policy is um, kind of an outlier um, globally. Uh, we take in legally more than 50% of all immigrants from all countries put together. Um, even in this uh, recession, we're taking in legally uh, over 700,000 a year, every year, year in and year out. Uh, we don't have jobs for these people. Um, our immigration policy is primarily driven by family-related concerns, not by job skills or business requirements. Uh, you have many businesses, particularly in IT, complaining about the fact that they can't get enough H-1B visas and at the same time, we are taking in by far the greatest number of legal immigrants who are largely unskilled. So, altering that policy toward one that is primarily focused, focused on the needs of the economy and business is, to my mind, long overdue. And in fact, um, overall, legal immigration should be driven in, in the direction of as close to zero as possible for unskilled family-related immigration and maximized for the sake of H-1B visas and other business-related uh, immigration or, or uh, job permits, one or the other. So, uh, Chris, can I ask Rick? Sure. Um, would that mean that you would give preference to, say, uh, a, a Saudi who's married to his cousin, uh, who is uh, deeply uh, religious and, and, and not a fan of the United States, but who wants to come here and work uh, and, and doesn't, and, and you know, can write code but can barely speak English, would he take precedence over, say, a blue collar worker from England? Rick, did you, uh, did you hear that question? I couldn't catch that totally. Uh, Mark, you want to repeat that one more time? I think Mark was. Chris, can you can you see? Because it's very hard to hear Mark from from here. Okay, Mark was asking. Uh, I, you know, Chris, uh, we'll, we'll waste time. On it. I'm sorry, Mark. I didn't hear you. No, if you, if you want to repeat the question to him, but I, I don't want to waste a lot of time just trying to relay questions, or if, if it's not uh, a good topic. Yeah, the uh, the question, Rick, was uh, uh, the. Uh, if it's a Saudi prince, uh, no, not a, not a prince. Uh, just a, just a, a Saudi who's married to his first cousin because that's okay over there. Who is uh, you know on the verge of being radical uh, Islamic, uh, but he's got he's got he's got a you know he can write a computer code that we have a shortage of here in this country. Uh, and maybe he's even you know been schooled in madrasa. Would he take precedence over a blue collar worker from England? Rick, did you uh, catch that? No, sorry, what was that? Yeah, uh, Rick is having trouble catching your question, but uh, basically, uh, should you take uh, somebody, say, from uh, the Middle East or Saudi Arabia, uh, in preference over uh, over who probably might have some political pull and who is uh, very rich but yet uh, doesn't have any particular job skills? Um, how would you uh, how would you segment him out in the selection process? And he's married to his first cousin. That's and, key. And he's married to his first cousin, right? <laughs> right. Uh, would you have? Uh, I think there's a case to be made, and other countries sponsor these sorts of uh, visas for you know wealthy investors who are willing to invest in the United States and set up a business and hire people. Um, but uh, the United States has you know 
sound like bizarre immigration policies. For example, they have a lottery for uh, diversity purposes. So the idea is you hand out visas uh, literally by lottery to people from different countries just so we can have some sort of diverse population. To me, this is just nonsense. Uh, I well, agree. Chris, um, Chris, Chris one, of the, one of the things that's nonsense is to have business and the economy dictating our immigration policy. Again, there is a lot more to a nation than its economy. It's important. It's vitally important. But when you start bringing in folks because you need some portion of the labor force, you have to recognize that you might be bringing in people who are linguistically different, culturally different, and historically different. And embedded in all those uh, are going to be people who deep down don't really want to be part of this plan. They just want to come make their money. And you know what? If they get pissed off, they might do something ugly. So you can, you can bring these people in, but you know, uh, you, you look at look at the experience that the Germans have had with all the Turks they brought in to work with them. They're not the happiest people in Germany right now, and the Tur and the Germans aren't all that happy with the Turks. You bring in a disparate population, and you're going to invite problems. Uh, yeah, and uh, there are other examples of that, certainly in France. Um, uh, there are examples all over the world. But you know, we, the, the one the, we can't even discuss this because you know we have the, the another one of our favorite historical myths. Uh, the United States was built by immigrants. Well, let's put that in perspective. If you look at the current population of the United States, around 300 million people, 75 million people can trace their ancestry back to the pre-revolutionary period. The people who came in the pre-revolutionary period were not immigrants. They, they were Brits. And when they came, they were colonists, and they considered themselves British, and they broke away. So one quarter of the U.S. population is therefore has nothing to do it has no immigrant base to them they were colonists then if you take a, a more narrow definition of what is an immigrant it's somebody who was born somewhere else it's not if your father immigrated that doesn't make you an immigrant if your grandparents immigrated that doesn't make you an immigrant your grandparents might have been immigrants your parents might have been immigrants. that doesn't make you one so that takes away another huge swath of the population and then you just say that immigrants built it then you're going to tell me that the natives here didn't build it uh we've built up this myth you know just to to to, to accept immigrants and there are times, you know, when, when it's necessary. Right now, it's not necessary with 8% unemployment. I don't care if we need H1Bs. You know, look at what, who universities admit. They admit people who are not American to study these courses. That's pretty interesting. And, uh, but uh, I have a question about, what about the, from the, uh, from the East, uh, uh, immigrants from China and Japan and uh, various parts of the East have assimilated themselves very well into the United States and uh, have produced no problems and, and have yet have produced uh, tremendous uh, intellects uh, uh, and are. Uh, uh, well, the, key, the, the, key word, the key word you said was they've assimilated themselves, and many of them have. But look at the history of the situation. Many of the Japanese who came over and who were interned had actually renounced their citizenship and were a big problem when we were at war with Japan. So there have been some bumps in the road, uh, and, and, and it has turned out for the best. But what the key word you said was they assimilated. We have people here who don't want to assimilate. That's a problem. People who just, out of hand, reject our language, reject our culture, reject our history. You go in to vote in New York City, there's 14 different languages on the ballot. That's, that longer term, that's not going to play out well. Should English be made as a, a, the primary language or the only language of, uh, of use in the United States? It should be the language of government. Look what happened in Macedonia. A lot of Albanians came and they said, hey, you know what? We don't really understand what's going on in the Macedonian Congress. So what happened? The Macedonian Congress now conducts business in two languages, half in Macedonian, half in Albanian. You tell me uh, how much you would enjoy if the U.S. Congress, for, for all of the idiocy that they propagate, if they did half of the day in um, English, and then they spent the rest of the day, let's not say Spanish, because a lot of us can understand Spanish, uh, the rest of the day in, say, Farsi, and they're taxing you in Farsi. How would you like that? Ask the Macedonian people how they like being taxed in Albanian. I think a lot of Americans would agree with uh, uh, with your summation there, um, and um, and I agree that the key is assimilation. It's uh, interesting to note also uh, one point that uh, uh, Rick made uh, pr uh, earlier that uh, skilled jobs and uh, uh, should be a major um, priority in immigration policy. Uh, I know that um, the uh, uh, when companies apply uh, each year for the, uh, I think it's about 60,000 visas, uh, places 
uh, for their uh, PhDs and their uh, people of knowledge uh, from without of the, uh, the United States, uh, that the applications of those uh, are limited to about 60,000 and those, and, and when they are opened up each year, the application slots are taken up within just a couple of hours. Um, so it's obvious that uh, uh, if, we, uh, if we heed uh, Rick's statement, uh, that uh, this should certainly be adjusted. Um, Rick, uh, any, any comments to add on, on what Mark said and, uh, and, the, uh, and the brain issue of uh, being able to import brains from abroad? Well, I think, let me make, draw a very clear distinction. I just, just because somebody gets a PhD in, the United, in a U.S. university doesn't necessarily mean they should be entitled to immigrate. If they, however, land a job with a U.S. company that wants them, then they should jump to the top of the priority list. Right, and that, this... That's my view. And this, uh, uh, Chris, this Chris, yeah, I, Chris, I would rather that job go to an American who's already here. Is maybe, you know, maybe someone whose family fought in the American Revolution might have a higher call on that job. Well, I think uh, this, uh, the the immigration uh, list that uh, these companies uh, uh, apply for are for jobs that they cannot fill here. Uh, that they're uh, well, no, no, they, they can't they can't fill them at the prevailing wage. They're willing to. There are immigrants who are willing to come over and undercut the wage. And if you know. Again, if, if all this country is is about consumer delight and fulfilling all of our, our, our consumption wishes and to, you know, have the lowest cost uh, and the most variety of, of, of consumer goods, then by all means, that should be our immigration policy. We should, we, what we should do maybe is deport all the Mexicans are here and bring over Bangladeshis who would be even cheaper. That might be an even better way. You know, if, you, if, if, if a Mexican guy is working in a kitchen right now for 500 bucks a week, bring over some Bangladeshis. They'd be happy to do it for 150 a week. Why not do that? It's a good point. So that brings up the question, uh, should we... Uh, but, but, you know, so, but it, the economy should not be driving immigration. Again, language, history, and culture, uh, you know, these are stick-in-the-mud type topics that no one cares about anymore. But you know, these are the kind of things when immigration is, has, has, has really happened in, 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 across the world where when you don't assimilate, you don't buy into language, history, and culture, you have problems down the road, even though everybody's fat, dumb, and happy and driving an SUV you know, and watching six-foot TV screens. Well, that brings up the question of how would you know whether one truly would like to assimilate into the society of the U.S.? Mark, do you have any, any criteria by which you'd be able to judge that in the future? Yeah, no, maybe Rick won't. I, I feel like I'm hogging up all the time here. Rick might want to toss in. <laughs> okay. Well, you're bringing up the, the major points, and so that's why I keep coming back to you. Um, it, it, it would be a difficult thing to make a criteria about one's future intent on becoming uh, an American. Um, and I think it would be a very difficult thing to, uh, to uh, uh, implement. I all, but I, I, I am truly believe that we also should, uh, one criteria should be the uh, the, for the jobs that we cannot fill here, and that's at both ends of the ladder, the very low jobs which are unskilled, which Americans don't want, also at the you high know, end of the ladder. You've, already got, you've, always got, you've always got to preface it. They don't want it at the prevailing wage, which certain people are willing to come to this country and drive down. What if we did import all those Bangladeshis over, and we had suddenly had an unemployed class of you know Mexican laborers who are now out of work in this country? What do we do with them? And then the Bangladeshis come, and then we bring in Burundians who are even cheaper than the Bangladeshis. And so we, we just keep having a growing underclass because there are certain people in the world who are willing to work at an even cheaper wage. Well, you, you've got to rise above that and realize if this is not about just the cheapest wage workers we can be in here. And ditto for the top end of the scale. Oh, absolutely ditto for the top end of the scale. But at the low end, you, you, you allow them as long as there is a request by employers. You've noted that... Chris, Chris, come on. Is there a bigger group of rent seekers than large business in America? These people, look at what Chipotle did. Chipotle is demanding. The guy went down and spoke to Congress, demanding that they allow more workers in. See, the problem is, when you take your average blue-collar American worker, he can't organize, he can't get together and do this, and the unions are fighting the wrong battle. But trust me, if we started letting in 
15,000 doctors a year from India and Cuba where they get paid $25 a month. The AMA would be in Washington, D.C., and that immigration flow would stop in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. When, when, when these guys came in, suddenly you go to the doctor for $40 for a visit. Th that game would be over fast. Oh, you want a hip replacement? I'll do it for 2000 bucks. It wouldn't happen. But what you're willing to do, you're willing to say to the low end of the American wage scale, hey, folks, we got people who are willing to undercut you, and we've got 10% unemployment. I don't care about 10% unemployment. Here comes a horde of people from Bangladesh who do this stuff for five bucks an hour. And by the way, uh, minimum wage laws, laws don't apply in agriculture. So that's where these people can all go work. And it, uh, minimum wage does not apply in the agricultural industry uh, because they were willing to, they, they were able to get that through Congress. Uh, and you will have a permanent underclass of people who have no desire to assimilate. So. Enjoy your cheap vegetables. Enjoy your consumer products, Chris. Enjoy this. This we keep going back to, you know, cheaper, cheaper labor. Uh, but remember, you're hurting fellow Americans. I, I would expect somebody from Michigan who, you know, has a, a relationship with the auto industry would understand this. <laughs> you, you have a you have a you you have a closer connection uh, through language, history, and culture with the residents of Michigan than you do with the residents of Dakar, Bangladesh. You can deny it, but you do. I think the the. Uh the best criteria that we can use for an immigration policy is one, uh, the selection of, of knowledge. Uh, the greater knowledge, the, the more important uh, he can become uh, uh, as an individual in the United States, and also by needs. And employers will help drive uh, the direction of that. And the two criteria together, I think, is my opinion, would be the best criteria by which, and of course your your mark uh, uh, a criteria of of culture and the will to assimilate himself into the culture of the United States. Perhaps all three criteria should be used in conjunction with each other to construct a good policy for immigration for the United States. That's about all the time we have uh, today, and I'd like to thank uh, my panelists, uh, Mark Brennan. From New York University. Okay, we we'll just agree to disagree on uh, immigration policy. Okay, well noted. And Rick Samuelson, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week at the Philosophical Angle. Thank wow. you. Thank you.